Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining Curators Introduce Art by Kerry Tribe and SOP. I'm Melanie Keane, and I'll be your host for this event. I'm the Director of Welcome Collection. My pronouns are she and her. For those of you who are new to our work, Welcome Collection is a free museum and library of health and human experience that aims to challenge the way we all think and feel about health by making connections across science, medicine, life, and art. If you haven't already visited us online, you can find out more about our work at welcomecollection.org. We're incredibly excited today to be able to share a first behind the scenes look into our upcoming exhibitions that explore the work of artists Kerry Tribe and SOP. Today, you're going to hear pre-recorded conversations with Welcome Collection curators, Shamita Shamashaja and Emily Sargent. And these were filmed during the installation of the artworks. Shamita will discuss how a Kerry Tribe standardized patient highlights the need for empathy between patients and doctors in a clinical setting. Whilst Emily will explore SOPs, the DEN one, uncovering their experience as someone who needed to shield during the COVID pandemic and how they sought respite in nature. Our event today takes its cue from a question we've been asking ourselves as a Museum of Health and Human Experience. What does it mean to be human now? The reopening programme, which includes work by Kerry Tribe and SOP, explores the intertwined connections between the individual, societal, global health, and asks how COVID-19 is shaping our perceptions of the fault lines between them. Inspired by our display, Being Human, the reopening programme considers how we can care for ourselves and for each other in the context of extraordinary cultural, social and political shifts. So over the coming months, the programme will bring multiple perspectives and voices into and outside of the building and across Welcome Collection's digital platforms. Some of the activity that I hope you'll be able to encounter is based on our approach to COVID-19 collecting and commissioning during 2020. So today's events ask us to consider the meeting point between our experience of professionalised healthcare and protective self-care. So before I hand over to Shamita and Emily, I'm going to briefly run through today's schedule and how we're going to run the session. As you should all be able to see, hopefully, this afternoon events, we have live speech to text, which is being provided by stage text. The event's going to be roughly an hour long. We're going to begin with Emily and Shamita's pre-recorded film. That's going to last just over 15 minutes. That will be followed by a live Q&A between me, Emily and Shamita. Please do participate and ask questions in Slido in time for the audience Q&A in the final 20 minutes of the event. If you're new to Slido, please head to www.sli.do and input the event code, which should be to the left or right of me on the top of the web page. We'll try to ask as many questions as possible in the time that we have. So head over to Slido. At Welcome Collection, we are committed to creating a safer online environment. And that means that we'll all have a positive experience. So we expect everyone to take responsibility for their conduct and their behaviour. Offensive language or behaviour will not be tolerated. This includes language that is racist, ableist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, abusive, religious or culturally offensive. The slider will act, be actively moderated. So I trust that you're going to communicate respectfully by following these guidelines. And they've all, the guidelines have also been shared in the event description. Thank you very much for your support and cooperation. Now with the run through, through over, you're going to get to hear from our speakers. First, you'll hear from Shamita. He curated our most recent temporary exhibition, The Compelling Playwell, which explored how play transforms both childhood and society. Shamita has curated exhibitions with subject matters as diverse as health related graphic design, forensic medicine and outside art. Then you'll hear from Emily, senior curator, who's curated numerous large scale exhibitions on a wide range of topics, including human enhancement and the experience of consciousness. And Emily also curated Living With Buildings, which considered the urgent connections between our homes and our health. 
Now I'm going to hand over to our AV gurus today who are going to start the film. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Melanie. My name's Shamita Sharmacharja and I'm the curator at Welcome Collection. I've got dark brown shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a blue dress and have brown eyes. I'm standing in the gallery where we're going to be showing Standard Eyes Patient, which is a two-channel video installation by American artist Kerry Tribe. Kerry Tribe is based in Los Angeles and works predominantly in film and video. Her work is concerned with perception, memory, subjectivity and performance, and she has a deep-seated interest in neuroscience. Standardized Patient was commissioned in 2017 by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and we're really delighted to be showing it for the first time in the UK at Welcome Collection. Standardized Patients is a term that is given to actors in the US who are employed to portray patients in the education of medical students. They're most commonly known as patient actors here in the UK. The actors portray patients that require different types of care so the students can practice their communication skills, learning to see the whole person rather than the set of symptoms. The work raises important questions about empathy and its place in healthcare and asks whether empathy is a skill that can be learned and assessed. The work was developed in close consultation with clinicians and communication experts at the University of Southern California and Stanford Medical School, where Tribe spent hours observing students as they studied and undertook exams. Tribe, who describes her work as documentary adjacent, then scripted four scenarios which she filmed and cut into a two-channel video installation that lasts approximately 17 minutes. The work follows a group of medical students as they undergo their Objective Structured Clinical Examinations, or OSCEs as they're known. In these exams, the students are presented with a patient and then they have 15 minutes to take an appropriate history, tell them what they think is going on and what the next steps are. The work comprises of two video projections which are shown on the opposite sides of a single screen, so you can never see both sides at the same time. One side shows live action encounters between the doctor and patient, whereas the other side shows fragments of scripts, results and photographs relating to the dialogue. At first sight, this side looks a bit dry, but in fact it's the side that offers up the clues that this work is in fact an artifice. We encounter four patients. The first is a woman in her 30s who's desperate to get back to work despite her irregular heart rhythms. Then there's a 16-year-old girl who's seeking advice about sexual health but also has broken heart. There's um, an older woman who is possibly displaying signs of early onset dementia. And then there's a man who is reaching towards the end of his life in the advanced stages of colon cancer. Each of these are raw human experiences that require much more than just textbook knowledge. We're now going to show a short clip of the work and for the purposes of online presentation, are showing the screens next to each other, but ordinarily they wouldn't be encountered at the same time. Richard? Hi. Uh, it's Diane again. Um, I think you fell asleep for a little bit. Um, I think the last thing you mentioned was that you're usually very vocal. Um, I, I, I had recommended that you don't hesitate to let people around you know what it is that you want. Um, and, and hopefully in that sense, um, you'll be able to have clearer communication and, and not have to expend as much energy. Um, time out. Time out, okay. Okay, um, Dan, why don't you come back and then... Okay, what do you, where do you guys want to go next? 
data has brought us up to a very good point. Um, are you on any medication now? Yes. I what? take Ritalin. Ritalin? Okay. Um, do you drink, smoke, do any kind of hard drugs? I don't do any drugs. Do you drink? Yes. Do you smoke cigarettes? Yes. About how many do you say you smoke in a day? Uh, I think it depends on the day. Depends on the day? Yeah. Okay. How's your family history? Um, do your parents have any illnesses, any diseases, anything, heart diseases, heart problems? My family has had uh, heart attacks. Heart attacks. Okay. Mother, father, both? My mother and father. Mother and father. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you before I continue on with this, when's the last time you had any sort of pain or um, any kind of discomfort in your chest area? Do you know? Uh, this morning. This morning? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were just getting ready, daily activities in the morning? Yeah. It's okay. pretty, pretty regular, just, just getting ready for work. And just getting ready for work? Yeah, heading out the door. Okay. You can see the actors have been trained to divulge information only when asked. So the doctors need to think about how they ask the questions in order to elicit the correct information. And not only that, when they get the answers, they need to respond to the emotional responses of the patient as well. We see the students as they try to navigate these complex situations that lie way outside of their own experience, such as how to relate to somebody as they approach the end of their life and how to make them comfortable. This brings to mind the concept of narrative medicine, which is a phrase that was coined by the Columbia professor and physician, Dr. Rita Sharon. She characterizes narrative competence as the ability to recognize, absorb, interpret, and be moved by stories of illness. It's the difference between saying, what's the matter, and what matters to you. We also see the element of performance in the medical encounter. Here, both the patient and doctor are acting. The doctor is performing in an exam and the actor is playing their patient, yet both are able to suspend their disbelief and make a connection. The setup of the installation is such that it is impossible to see the whole picture, with knowledge and experience portrayed on two sides of the same screen. In some way, this represents the disconnect between doctors and patients when the patients have the lived experience and the doctors the medical knowledge. However, in this scenario, it's the patients who have the power and assess the doctor. Some of the most significant events of our lives are shared with healthcare workers from when we are born to the care we receive at the end of our days. More than anything, Tribe's work highlights the human connection that forms a critical part of any care relationship. For all the routine regularity of medical appointments, there is no such thing as a standardised patient. Rather, on both sides of the examination table, we are all human and all unique. I had to move and move quickly. I'm not allowed to explore my new surroundings as I'm not allowed to leave the house. I have a new name now. I'm a shielder. People, surfaces and the air have become dangerous to me. I'm safe in my new home but I can't sleep so I leave the house before dawn to explore the wood. The wood has been calling me. It wanted me to move here and it did everything in its power to draw me here. Things which shouldn't have slotted into place aligned quickly. Its branches beckoned me and so I pay it attention. I respond to its call. My name is Emily Sargent and I'm Senior Curator at Welcome Collection. I have shoulder length hair, I'm wearing glasses and a blue jumpsuit. And I'm standing in one of our galleries with grey-green walls in front of two unframed prints of a den in woodland. One in semi-darkness, the other lit by the early morning sun. You've just heard the opening lines of Sot's The Den, a three-part meditative sound piece which is inspired by and documents their experience of lockdown and of shielding as the COVID-19 pandemic has evolved. In March, like many others living with chronic illness or undergoing treatment, Sot was advised to stay home 
and avoid other people. As we heard in those opening lines, in that moment, everything familiar became dangerous. Their home, their friends, their networks of care, all posed a potential threat. They moved house to ensure they could be safe. And in the absence of those networks of care, they looked to the woods nearby. Sop is a London-based artist, a musician, whose practice is rooted in the queer punk DIY scene. They write and perform in bands Wolf and Child's Pose, and their solo music project is called DMF. As part of the collective Rita Munis, they run workshops using writing as a radical creative tool to explore themes related to chronic illness, working directly with participants who bring lived experience as part of a shared collaborative practice. And they employ some of those modes of working in this piece, where experience is processed through language, which in turn is processed through rhythm, through layering of voices and the sounds of the woods. I am the wood, and the wood is The bushes and trees have messages for you. The bushes and trees they have messages for you. They have observed us. They observe you. They have observed us. We come and go. The trees remain. We come and go. They the offer comfort remain. and guidance to those they seeking wishes. They offer comfort and guidance to those seeking wishes. The trunks of the trees are the same size. The trunks of the trees are the same size. I wrap my arms around them and they measure I wrap my arms around them and they measure I am the wood. The wood is me. I am the wood. They shield the shoulder. And I imagine they shield the shoulder. And I imagine they wouldn't arms. In their early morning walks in the woods, themselves a small act of rebellion against the clacks and call of the stay-at-home message, Sop's connection to the woods deepens. The trees become part of their community, those networks of care. Like many others this year, finding comfort in nature in an environment seemingly unmoved by the crisis unfolding in our society as our carefully constructed notions of reality unravel. But this isn't a pastoral ideal of rolling hills or an awe-inspiring majestic outlook, rather an ordinary piece of urban woodland bordering a quiet cemetery in South London. And it's here that they make their den. In the work, Sop describes another den from another time and for them another moment of escape. Their dens, this one built in the woods, the other built to elude the conformity of school, exist in liminal spaces, the uncultivated, unattractive spaces in between, as Sop describes them. And these spaces can be seen to represent the liminality of queer existence. The structure of the den, woven into the landscape, conceals them from passers-by, from the world, with Sop offering guidance in the ideal position and construction of the den. No parallel lines using materials that others might see as rubbish, and again interrogating the dominant culture of usefulness and productivity. And the den isn't only a place to hide, it's a reclamation of space and of agency. It's an act of self-determination, carving out a place in the world for the shielder, for the sick, for themselves. And the shelter it provides is symbolic, and I'm reminded of the end of Lars van Trier's film Melancholia, where Kirsten Dunst's character constructs a rudimentary den for her, her sister, and her young nephew as they face the impending destruction of the earth. It can't protect them from the impact, but it contains their experience and offers them some form of control over it. And so the den is a shelter, a talismanic structure of protection, and an act of defiance, all rolled into one. At the end of this first chapter, we find Sop in their den, highly attuned to their surroundings, the muted human activity of early lockdown, the movement of the birds around them, and their connection with the earth. I meditate, sinking deep into the tree and the earth. The wood tells me to slow down. I acquiesce. I know this is right for me. There is no rush. I can take my time, observe, rest think and listen to the lessons the wood has for me. Trust in the wood. Become nature. There is a fluttering in the holly bushes above me. It is two sparrows. I am so still that the birds can come close. They notice me and make more noise, but they do not move away. In the creation of this work, Sop opens up their experience and their perspective of those months of early lockdown as they came to terms with a new identity. 
a heightened visibility as the message to protect the vulnerable was broadcast far and wide, and yet remaining invisible, isolated and alone. But this is also an invitation to other shielders to explore their experience, to build their own dens, either real or imagined, to carve out that space, whether it be physical or mental, to escape to and to be safe. SOP describes the fertile space for creativity that the chronically ill experience can offer. Different experiences on a different time with different bodies with fluctuating capacities. By placing this work in dialogue with Kerry Tribe's film, we're aiming to explore and amplify the different ways in which we give and receive care. From the polished performance of clinical medical practice to individual and community-led strategies of self-care. It's part of a wider inquiry into what it means to be human now and how we care for ourselves and for one another. Both works will be on display in our galleries from January the 5th, but for those of you who can't join us, you can listen to The Den in full online at welcomecollection.org. Thank you. That was a, a great film that really helped to um, amplify some of the, the issues in the work. Um, they're really meditative and moving works, which is slow in pace and probably appeal to how our lives are like now. I was really struck by Kerry Tribe's work and that multi-dimensional -dimen aspect of patients' needs. And it represents the nature of the dynamic between the patron, patient and the doctor. And we as patients are not just a set of words or a diagnosis. And as Shamita says, it's not important to ask what's the matter, but what matters to you to really examine the human inside. Um, and with SOP's work, I was struck by how many people feel more connected to nature during lockdown. And SOP has cast this connection with nature, creating a shelter as a radical act, as an act of defiance, um, of lo locating oneself in nature as being um, outside of what might, one might exist as the traditional or the mainstream, which is a powerful place to kind of enact um, radical behaviors. Um, I was also really struck by Sop's point about fertile space for creative creativity. And I think that's a powerful point to make across both works. It made me think about the spaces where creativity takes place, whether that's role play in a hospital by actors and non-actors, in a den, in a woodland, inside and outside, which is really aptly reflected in the way that the, um, the two spaces are curated. And I really hope um, that you will have the opportunity to come and visit or go online and hear, find out more about the work. The final um, uh, aspect that really appealed to me, just having seen the film, was about sound. It's powerfully evocative in both works. You can hear the buzz of the lights in the um, the hospital, there's a slightly foreboding soundtrack, there's the crunch of ground underfoot um, in Sop's piece, and there's bird song. it's incredible. It really, um, it really gets inside your head. And of course, there's the human voice, which has a lyrical dimension to it. So I'm gonna um, move on to talk to Emily and Shamita about their experience of working with the artists and curating the show. Um, if you haven't asked a question yet, and you have a question kind of developing inside, please go to Slido, that's www.sli.do and, and input the event code. Um, as I said before, it should be on the left or right of me on the top of the web page. So um, Emily and Shamita, I'm going to put, pose this question to Emily first. You, you spoke, spoke a bit about this at the end of the film, but how do you think, could you say more actually about how you think the, um, each of the artist's work speaks to one another. Thanks, Melanie. Well, in, in responding to this extraordinary, um, this moment in time, as you mentioned in your introduction, in terms of how we think about our health, but also um, in terms of these extraordinary shifts in kind of society and cultural and political movements, we were thinking about this, um, the importance of care, um, but also in all the different ways that it, it manifests. Um, and these two particular works, I think, resonate very particularly with some of those aspects of care that have, have, um, have become much more um, visible, perhaps, um, in this time. Our relationship 
as you say, with um, the kind of polished performance of, of medical care um, and what comes along with that, but also how we can come to terms by ourselves or develop strategies to care for ourselves and for our immediate circle. And so putting these two works in conversation, I think, really brings attention to how um, care exists across the spectrum of these different environments and these different ways of performing both for ourselves and, and for each other. Melody, you're on mute. Yeah, I had to have them. Um, Shamita, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, how do you think um, each of the artist's works speak to each other? What's the nature of the dialogue between works? Well, as Emily said, um, I think that care really does run through both works. But I think it's also interesting to think about the fact that they're both time-based media and also the fact that they use um, kind of time in different ways. So they're both approximately about the same amount of time. They're both um, about 17 minutes long, but they use time in, yeah, there seems to be a different conception of time. So with Kerry's work, it's, you know, about this 15 minute encounter where you have to try and give us over as much um, information as possible. Whereas um, SOPS uh, work seems to be more about um, earth time or a different conception of time. So I think that's really interesting. And there are also themes about agency and control that I think really comes through in both works as well. Thank you. Um, so I suppose taking some of those themes further and whether you might those ideas of agency and control, how have you found developing an exhibition during a pandemic? Can you speak about the challenges and the opportunities that our current context has raised? Well, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess one of the challenges really for um, curating in this context is obviously, uh, you know, it's shifting sounds, everything sh changes from day to day and week to week and, and month to month. So obviously there are logistical challenges that come with that. But also I think that given that we're a museum that's dedicated to health and human experience, about thinking about how we can um, really deal with these issues kind of um, responsibly reflexively and also without kind of um triggering people or being sensitive to people's experience um but i think one of the um, opportunities i guess that comes out of this situation is that the pandemic has really exposed lots of issues including health inequality and has also really brought to the surface what really matters to people as well and i think that exhibitions can perform and um, provide a platform for having some of those discussions um, same question to Emily. Yeah, and I think um, just to echo what Shamita said, we have this incredible platform to give voice to lots of different kinds of experience and lots of different kinds of perspectives, but also to turn some of those inside out in a way. So one of the things that I think is a real opportunity with these two works in dialogue, but across the programme actually, in, of what we're doing online as well, is to, to re-examine some of those things that we think are familiar. So one of the things I think that makes Kerry Tribe's work so powerful in this moment is how we've been forced to really um, re-examine how, um, how we consider the, the, the vulnerability of healthcare workers. So our doctors aren't just um, these kind of invulnerable um, people, but they are human like the rest of us and they have frailties, um, whether that's emotional, moral um, or or physical, physiological at risk like everybody else. And those stories have really come out in some of the work that we've been doing at this time, mm. as well as then being able to share these very intimate experiences and put them in conversation with each other in order to, to amplify those that might otherwise mm. remain hidden. Um, I have one more question to ask actually before we move to Q&A which is around um, the use of the voice or the sound, uh, the, the voiceover, I think, in the, in the works. And I suppose with Kerry Tribe's work, um, Shamita, I'm interested in the kind of the use of the text 
alongside with the moving image. And I just wondered um, if you could say a bit more about that. You spoke about it a bit in the film, but it's, they're very different experiences. And I suppose for you, Emily, afterwards, is to talk that sense of kind of sitting in front of these large scale, really luscious photographs, having the sound, you know, Sop's voice in your head, a different kind of communication. So um, I wonder if you could kind of say a little bit more about about that sort of more formal aspect of the work, Shmita. Sure. So the work, as I mentioned in the film, is you know, a two sided work. And on the side that you encounter first in our installation, which we call Side A, is really looking at the live action encounters between the medical student and the patient. And on the back of the um, kind of fragments of, of script and results and uh, photographs relating to the dialogue. So it's only really when you encounter the back of the work, you realise that the whole work is actually an artifice. It's actually been scripted entirely. Um, and that really, I think, is um, that kind of withholding of information, I think, is, is very pertinent to the whole encounter with the medical encounter. And I think that actually the way that, that Kerry developed the work is that she had actually scripted the whole of the four scenarios. They were filmed almost in documentary style, and then she selected which clips were going to be shown. So I think that your sympathy does this a, a tremendous kind of flip flop when you realise that actually when you go around the side and you see that the patients are actually actors and the medical students have been performing an exam, you feel very differently about about the work. And and Emily, we could take more from you. Yeah, and, and the the um the intimacy of the narration of Sop's work is really striking. And you listen to it when you're in the gallery in a different way. So the sound for Kerry's film is out loud. It's a shared experience. Whereas as you move into into the den space, you listen to that audio on headphones. Um, and it really feels like um, that voice is in your head and you're, you're um, in, in what is now a much dimmer space than you saw in the film. And it really feels like you're contained, you're cocooned within this, within this space um, with this very evocative um, soundtrack of, of the woods alongside these layered voices which sort of interrupt each other. And it's a very poetic, lyrical um, experience with a sort of very kind of steely experience at the heart of it. Um, you know, this is this is a serious um, conversation. But also it's interesting to think about the relationship also of script, um, because in the space, and, and actually if you, if you look at the, the Den online, you'll be able to access this too, there is the transcript available and that's laid out very much like a script with, with the, um, with the words laid out on one side and the sound effects described on the other. So it's it feels like those two things are really directed and working in parallel. So although it has this intimacy and, and musicality um, to it, it is also very, um, very structured. Mm. Yes, I love the idea of um, the performative as well and I think an artifice, which in some respects you might liken to our experience now there's something very otherworldly about the experience that we're having now through this global pandemic um so uh if you want to ask any questions please head over to slido um i'm going to ask our first question um that's come through and this is specifically around care and it is a word that's being used in culture institutions it's become more prevalent, but it's definitely being expressed in different ways across the arts and culture in the last few years. But at the moment, it seems to be a word which is taking on um, significant sort of responsibility. Um, so uh, the question is, how would you describe networks of care? Um, uh, the person asking the question would love to know more about your perspectives working in a museum. Shanita? So I think in terms of concepts of care, we have a kind of lots of, I'm thinking about lots of different kind of duties of care that we have in the museum, whether that's caring for our collection or whether it's for thinking about our visitors and in this particular instant, thinking about kind of the physical safety of, of um, visitors in the pandemic. So um, when the museum 
be open to it, you'll see that, um, that quite a lot of measures have been put in place to make our visitors feel safe in terms of social distancing and how to experience the museum from each other, I guess. Um, so I think it's very um, kind of, it's a really interesting question and there are many, many different ways that you can kind of take the question. But I guess in terms of kind of staging an exhibition that has um, care as its main concept is really kind of a publication to society to think about care and think about the role of it in, in our society and what that means now during the pandemic. And Lily, can I ask you the same question? Yeah. How would you describe networks of care? And I know you said uh, a couple of times in the film, and and really I'm thinking about it there in terms of how um, there are there are um, that care exists beyond, for example, the treatment that you undergo for a condition that you might have, or for the interactions that you have with with those professionals that. Um, that you might see in Kerry's work, but instead it's an extension of that into the spaces that you that you exist in, the exchanges that you have, the relationships that you hold. And I think it's those networks that start to um, feel eroded at the beginning of, of, that, of, that, of that piece of work where the communities that you might have um, shared start to represent a danger to you. And I think... Um, in the For All I Care podcast, which is, is you can also find online, um, it's a collaboration with The Baltic. Um, there's a conversation with Ted Kerr, who describes himself as an HIV doula. And he's very um, articulate about that sense of that, that the care that is important in, in that experience isn't just a medical one, but it's a, it's a set of networks and communities that all feed into the experience and identity as well as the kind of medical experience and it's those kind of um, relationships that we start to see shifting in socks work from the people that otherwise they would be surrounded by into this other experience where the trees become you know almost a community a, a site of exchange there's like a physical exchange as they describe wrapping their arms around them and actually as the work develops it develops into a second chapter um, they, they describe the experience almost of, of turning into them, the words of that of, of that relationship, even becoming, becoming part of their body and, and how they how they consider themselves. So it's a real strength, um, a feeling around those kind of relationships that we rely on. Thank you both. Um, uh, Emily, I'm really glad you mentioned for all I care because I started thinking about Ted Kerr as well and. Um, uh, when he was speaking about how care is embodied, how it's through, the, how it's enacted through the body, and what the body represents um, in those uh, in those networks, which is really powerful. Um, uh, please do go and listen to the podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast. It's um, it's an incredible sort of multi-dimensional piece of work. Uh, so uh, I have another question that's come in. Um, which is a, a really important one for us to consider as a museum of health and human experience. Um, can you speak about the tension for the institution between the spectacle of health and care, in particular with artists who are themselves in need of care? I'm going to go to Emily for this one. Yeah, it's a great question and it's um, something that we're all um, I think feeling very alert to, um, particularly as we're working um, not just on this exhibition actually, but in those commissioning uh, activities that you mentioned at the beginning, and across our platforms with with people who, as you say, do have need of care. Um, and so we have, you know, some processes in place, um, which I hope um, I won't go into detail here. But in order to take account of, of those needs, but also um, to be alert very much in the public space about the relationship between amplifying, advocating allyship um, and also the yeah, spectacle, exploitation, you know, carelessness. And I really um, 
obviously hope, hope that we are we're falling, falling on the right lines of that. But I would also um, say that institutionally, we are made up of individuals, and many of us have, of individuals do have some experience of some of the things that we're we're, we're trying to address in our in our program. So there is that sense of which it's a shared endeavour um, to explore the human condition and health of which we all share um, an experience of. Do you, do you have a view on that? Um, absolutely. I think that um, what Emily said is um, really kind of brings things true for, for me as well and thinking about what we do at Welcome in terms of amplifying voices but doing it in a way that's not talking for people but instead providing a platform for people to talk. I think that's the, the, main, the main difference really. Thank you. Um, so an, another question which uh, asks um, specifically about who cares for carers. So Kerry Tribe's work also shows humanity in the medical profession, in medical professional training. Do you see healthcare workers as audience for this work? I mean, who does care for the carers? Yeah, absolutely. I see um, uh, healthcare workers as um, audience for this for this show. I mean, we're located directly next to UCLH, which is one of the main hospitals in London, which has been um, kind of at the forefront of the COVID response. Um, and I think that the work really does kind of really highlight that those aspects of vulnerability and humanity that um, we've seen so much of during this pandemic. So you see on one hand that like kind of tremendous kind of sacrifice that healthcare workers have made in order to care for each other. Um, and then um, uh, I just got a message through that there's a problem with the audio. Um, so I think that our AV team are just going to take a pause to reset the audio and then we'll continue. Uh, welcome back everyone. We um, are having a few technical issues but I think they're being resolved in the background. So I'm just going to do a recap on the, the question if that's okay. Um, so we were talking about uh, Chloe Tribe's representation of humanity of medical professionals um, going through training and um, the question was do you see healthcare workers as an audience for this work? Who cares for the carers? Thank you very much, Emily, for recapping the question. So, yes, absolutely. But I can see how care workers as an audience for this work. And thinking about who cares for the carers is, is very pertinent to right now. And I think that one of the aspects of Kerry's work that works so beautifully is actually kind of uh, seeing that kind of doctors are people who or once young students who went into their profession with perhaps life experience that doesn't uh, necessarily inform the diagnoses that they have for, for people and I think that the idea that empathy is a, a skill that can be learned is a um, kind of quite a heartening idea but also I think that it is quite interesting in thinking about um, clinician burnout and the idea of kind of empathetic exhaustion where it obviously to empathize with your with your patients in a system that perhaps does not allow for resourcing of wanting to um kind of provide the kind of services that you would like to and um, makes it very difficult and then thinking about kind of burnout and thinking about kind of emotional exhaustion or desensitization or kind of um ideas about about feeling disempowered, I think, is, is very important. Sorry, Melanie, I think you're on mute. It's really critical and um, coincidental that you talk about the, um, I think the expression you used was empathetic exhaustion. Uh, and the next question we have um, asks, are there limits to are there limits to empathy? Would compassion be more authentic? Uh, 
Um, I think in terms of, of Carrie's work, I think compassion and, and empathy kind of go hand, hand in hand. And um, so you see in the work, um, you know, in these four scenarios, <clears throat> one of the um, scenarios is a 16 year old girl who has gone to the doctor asking for advice about birth control, but really she's there because she has a suspicion that perhaps she's got an STI, and, and indeed it, like, she finds out that she actually has got contracted herpes from her first sexual partner. And um, so obviously, the medical diagnosis is, is one part of this kind of um, scenario, but really it's kind of about. The, the compassion that the doctor has for the girl in in um, kind of first of all performing this kind of quite uh, invasive procedure, I guess, in some ways to be able to do um, an examination, which um, in the in the work is that the results are just passed over. But um, but also it's about the situation, the human situation, and thinking about kind of heartbreak in a way. So I think that, that they go hand in hand. Emily, did you have anything to say in relation to empathy versus compassion? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a strange way of thinking of it, of it isn't it, to think of them in, in, in competition in some way. Um, I agree that they, they are, they kind of coexist and, and not just in, um, in Kerry's work, but across both pieces where you're thinking about um, inhabiting perspectives um, and sort of turning that sense of, of authority on its head to say, why don't we listen actually to the patient? Why don't we listen to the person who brings their experience to the table? Let's take a step towards each other. And perhaps that is compassion rather than empathy, but it, it, it works across those two, two conversations. Thank you. One question specifically for Shanita, which is about the term used, um, documentary adjacent, which, is, which Kerry uses to describe her work. I wonder if you could say more about what that means in terms of her approach to moving image. Yeah, certainly. So, um, Kerry has a really interesting practice um, and I think that in terms of thinking about documentary adjacent in terms of standardised patients, I can definitely talk about her, uh, her previous work as well, but um, so the idea about being documentary adjacent is that when you encounter the work, you, it feels real, it feels like a, it's a fly on the wall kind of type of, of uh, documentary in, in many ways. However, then you kind of notice, as you would have seen in the clip, there are things that just don't quite ring true. Like, for example, the, um, the medical supervisor stepping in and saying time out when the student was really struggling. Um, so I think that the idea of documentary Jason is that it, her work is quite often um, rooted in reenactment um, of kind of true or, uh, or factual accounts. So in this case, um, she had observed um, hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of teaching and medical examinations um, through it, um, the University of Southern California and Stanford Medical School. And from that, she scripted these four scenarios. And then from those four scenarios, she edited it to, to kind of create the work that we see. So I think there's a step of remove that you don't initially kind of realise, but when you do realise it's something in that space between the reality and the fiction that the meaning of the work kind of lies. Um, and you can see that in, in, in her previous work as well, such as um, HM, which is a work that was made in 2009 that was actually shown at Welcome before, um, where the, in the show that Emily curated, in fact, um, so which is kind of reenactment of the true um, story of a man known only as patient HM, who had, became the textbook um, example for persistent amnesia. So HM only had a 20 second um, short term memory. And this is kind of um, shown in the film. It's a single 60 millimeter film that's um, fed through two different projectors with a 20 second 
delay and you get kind of this idea of the disconnect through that as well. On to our last question. Thank you for that, Shanisa. So um, we're going to start with Emily. What's the overall message of the show? Some final takeaway thoughts. We've talked a lot, I think, about, about care and compassion and empathy. And I think um, when I was in the space yesterday, um, really immersed in these two different works together, my feeling going away from it was really that, that we can listen to each other um, and we can take care of each other through that act of listening and act of seeing and holding. And I think um, that is true of both kinds of experience that like, these two very different works um, embody, which is that we can listen to each other in that, in that medical encounter. So that's a two-way empathetic exchange there, but also we can listen to those who have lived experience of chronic illness and, and we can learn from that. Um, so really that's, for me, what, what comes out of it is, is to hear each other and to see each other. So I think that kind of humanity really kind of shines through in both works. Um, I think that that idea about human connection, whether it's between two people in the medical encounter or with the or with um, SOPS work and the sharing of their their experience, I think there's um, a, a tremendous kind of, in a way, uplifting optimism I think about this idea that we can connect with each other even, even in these like kind of very strange disconnected times when we're not allowed to be together in the same way as we ordinarily will, would be. I think that both works kind of really have this shared humanity that I hope will um, really resonate with the people who see it and our audience. Thank you both so much for your contributions tonight. Um, I really hope that people get an opportunity to watch the film again um, and when we reopen, come and experience the works. Um, that was a really uplifting note to end on, that idea of shared humanity. I hope that everyone will take that away and, and hold that and think about that in relation to and some of the great works that, um, that, that are being produced. Um, I want to uh, thank you for talking about the work, for providing insights, making connections, that's Sanitise Patient at N1, and also a big thank you to our audience for your questions, which really helped bring today's event to life. I'd also like to thank ArtQuest and Unlimited as commissioners of SOPS work, which was supported by Art Council England, and also thank you to our tireless AV team, who helps keep us connected, sort out the sound, is working really diligently in the background. I hope the interruption wasn't too um, difficult for you to, tonight. Um, that is a sign of the times that we're living in. Um, please do stay connected to Welcome Collection um, and uh, visit our website to find out about upcoming programmes um, and also go to welcomecollection.org for any other updates. Thank you so much for coming along tonight and goodbye.